That is, a, that is about one foot too far off the edge of the table. Uh, Alright, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. yep. Yep. Sure. Welcome everybody to the Bruddy Critics Guide to Better Fan Fiction. Uh, this is my uh, the two hours of my obligatory three to be uh, qualified as a community guest. So one more hour and I get in for free. Uh, um, I'm just going to let you guys know ahead of time that I am not completely 100%. You know, I'm tr I think I'm trying to fight back a little bit of con flu. You guys probably understand that a little bit. Um, so if I suddenly get quiet or like really nervous, don't worry. These guys are the only ones that will splash them. Uh, okay. So, also for anyone who uh, couldn't be here, uh, I am recording this. We are recording this. Okay. So you guys will be able to check this up on my YouTube page. That is, uh, just go on YouTube and type in The Brony Critic. I'm the only one. <laughs> and that's actually really great, is when you start a YouTube channel and you're the only guy with your particular name. That, that's the sign of a good brand. Um, Alright, so, what are exactly are the goals of this panel? Alright, so the goals of this panel are to provide advice and guidance for hopeful fan fiction, fiction authors, as well as to, like, to improve and expand upon their bodies of work, and mostly to help you guys establish and figure out what some good writing habits are. Uh, let's, okay, yeah. <laughs> to analyze what makes certain genres, cliches, and tropes work while others don't. Uh, you know, so we, we've all read those fan fictions that we know, like they sound really great, and then you read them, and like, no, undo, like backspace, take away my luck. <laughs> Reverse the light. Um, you know, so just trying to figure out, you know, from my personal experience, and I've read probably about, like, last time I checked, it was two weeks worth of fan fiction collectively. Like, if you did nothing but read fan fiction nonstop for 24 hours straight, I would have read about two weeks worth. Um, I have no life. <laughs> Work in fan fiction, that's about it. Uh, um, Alright, as well as we want to be able to make note of important qualities in each genre of fan fiction, as well as to give examples of the works which best exemplify the best and the worst. Because there are certainly fan fictions that do mystery to its absolute best, that do adventure to its absolute best. And if you guys have questions or comments or recommendations, uh, be sure to, uh, I'll have a question and comment section at the end of the uh, panel. I don't know how long the actual presentation will be, so it could be like 30 minutes of questions, it could be an hour and a half. Uh, let's see how it goes from there. Alright, I think the first question, and uh, the guy who was in here previously, he did the uh, transformative art panel, and he brought up an interesting point that I actually rather liked, is he noted ask the question, is fan fiction good? Um, most of you guys have probably dealt with or heard of a, a quick, quick note, how many people out there are fan fiction writers or hopeful fan fiction writers? That is a fantastic number. I am so happy about that. Why do you think we're here? <laughs> 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 What's up? Maybe you wanted to see me? Maybe you guys liked me? <laughs> I know I can do it. You know, that actually stings a little bit more than you, or than you might realize when I was up yesterday at the opening presentations and they're introducing me. What does it feel like to be the least famous famous person here? <laughs> <laughs> we know you by your skill, not by your face. Thank you. I mean, you come from the dead spot with Midnight Bears in the other room, so... Uh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th this is honestly the most people I've had in a panel since maybe my first year, and that was, I wasn't even here <coughs> then. Uh, anyway, you know, so this, he brought up the question about the nature of transformative art and whether fan fiction is good. And, you know, 
it's constantly brought up by authors, copyright uh, <clears throat> enthusiasts, and uh, critics, obviously. You know, not just brony critics or you know people who enjoy like internet critics. The internet critics are obviously going to be a bit more lenient towards it, but actually, like professional critics, Roger Ebert made comments on fan fiction and the nature of fan work and things like that. And you know, the, there's there are questions of its its overall quality of whether fan fiction is inherently, you know, is it inherently of lesser quality than regular stuff? I'd say no. Actually, there I, there are points where I actually think that the works the fans make is more interesting than the show, uh, which is why I you know, review Rony stuff. Uh, you know, there's also the right to intellectual possession, you know, copyright, and you know. The one that's probably the most common is what I would call the narrative divinity of the author. It's the, the author is always right. The author is the god of their universe. And at some point I'd say that is correct. That is an opinion I do hold. But I, I think it has some negative connotations. Yeah, Star Wars so, one. <laughs> yeah, yes. uh, Star Wars one. Thank you. That's a very, very good point. Uh, because here's the irony with that: if copyright had gone out on Star Wars, it would have ended in 1999, the year Episode One came out. So Star Wars could have been in the public domain the year Phantom Menace came out. Anyone could have made their own Star Wars movies. We haven't gotten Episode Seven back in 1999. But Mickey Mouse got older. But Mickey Mouse got older. Uh, uh, now, some authors like George R. R. Martin are deeply critical and negative of fan fiction, uh, which is why you don't see a whole lot of Game of Thrones fan fiction out there, because he and his editors and his copyright uh, cronies, uh, for lack of a better term, they're very, very stringent on you know his material. But then you get other uh, authors, like Eric Flint and Harry Turtledove, a lot of science fiction guys. Like, I'm a huge science fiction, particularly alternative history fan. And uh, Eric Flint and Harry Turtledove are amazing when it comes to fan fiction, because many of them started off that way, you know? And, you know, they started off in that position, Harry Turtledove, his first book, the, uh, the, uh, Belisar no, not the Belisar uh, no, sorry, Harry Flint's the Belisari series, the uh, Videso series by Harry Turtledove actually started off as a Lord of the Rings fan fiction. Uh, he was studying uh, Byzantine history, and like he was going to school for Byzantine history, because that's clearly going to get you a lot of money when you get out. Um, but he decided to adapt some Byzantine history and put in Lord of the Rings characters and eventually changed the name, published it, and that became the Videso series, the uh, an emperor for her, the emperor for a legion, or whatnot. I'm trying to remember the name. Of uh, and then, of course, you know, Harry Turtle is a good example, but there's probably another good example. E.L. James. Say what you will about Fifty Shades of Grey. It made oodles of money. It was highly successful, and it managed to bring in a lot of people and a lot of interest. And can, we do, can I point something interesting out about that? Yep. If you actually look at the, uh, all of the press was saying before it came out that the fan fiction had millions of readers, but if you actually looked at the numbers, what actually happened was it had about 10,000 readers, but they misinterpreted the hit count. They didn't understand how hate counts were. <laughs> so they marketed the hell out of it, and that's why they that's why it sold millions of copies. Right, because I mean hit, hit counts just mean how many people click on the page and the view counters kind of tend to each, fall. Tend each, to fall. Each page. Each page oh a hundred chapters. Mm. Wow. Alright, Yeah, that actually yeah, ten ten thousand, a hundred yep. The math checks out. Uh, <laughs> um, Alright. Now, there are some who use fan fiction as a means to expand upon their work, or to like start in their careers to experiment and figure out their own voices. But then there are others who use it to expand upon their material, or to expand upon the materials of the world, particularly when that world is no longer being explored. 
after the Reichenbach Falls uh, mystery with uh, Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle hung it up. He didn't want to do it anymore because it had occurred right after World War I. His son had died. He had no interest, no interest in Sherlock Holmes at all. So fan fiction writers started publishing uh, basically fan Sherlock Holmes stories. They would get published in magazines and stories, kind of in the same magazines that eventually fantasy and science fiction writers would go into. And eventually there was so much interest, so much buzz in these post Reichenbach uh, Sherlock Holmes stories that eventually Doyle was inspired to go back into Sherlock Holmes. So actually it allowed, it gave fans the means to continue the hype until the books can come back. I think it was also the fact that uh, there was so much demand that he was being paid incredibly well, like 5000 per story, which back then was an insane amount. Oh, yeah. I mean, Sherlock Holmes was a phenomenon. Nobody made huge amounts of money writing. Like, this is, you know, this is around, like, the Victorian... This is like at the end of the Victorian age, you know, when you had to be the tortured bohemian artist. Um, oh, wait a minute, oh, wait a minute. See. <laughs> getting a little bit ahead of myself. All right, so ultimately, fan fiction is an exercise in self-discovery. Fan fictions make use of established worlds and characters, allowing writers more freedom to focus on dialogue, on narrative and world building, without necessarily having to worry that the writers accept their world. Because whenever you are Whenever you are trying to introduce a new intellectual property, the thing you have to do, first and foremost, is get the people interested in what, like, why should they care that, you know, why should we care about a farm boy on a desert planet? You know, why should we care about a bunch of, you know, short drinking people in a field in this ring? Why should we care about those things? You know, but with fan fiction, you can take that initial defense. If people are going to look for your fan fiction, they know what they're looking for. They have an invested interest in the world already. You now just have to provide them with a story that satiates that desire. You know, so they use it as a template to expand their own literary voice, as well as reveal some internalized themes, cliches, and thought processes. We all have our own internal voices. We all have those particular themes and whatnot that speak to us, that are usually based on either on our own experiences or the things we would like to experience. The cliches that no matter how much we might not like them, we can't help denying that we either fit into or deeply identify with. And by writing, it gives us an opportunity to expand and explore that. So, my first tip to you guys when it comes to uh, fan fiction, write often and read even more so. <laughs> uh, learn to identify the various different writing styles and compare them to your own. Like, don't just read one particular author. Read a whole bunch. Even read bad authors because you can even learn from bad authors. They can tell you what not to do. All right, now we're going to go into the basics of fan fiction, you know, before ink even meets paper. You know, the three, there are three really important factors that have to be considered. Those are intention, oh, there's a glitch, there's a glitch in there. Intention, why are you writing your fan fiction? The length, how long will your final narrative be upon completion? And genre. <coughs> what themes, tropes, and elements which characterize your story. All three of these have to be considered before a single word is ever typed. You know, intention. Why are you writing your fan fiction? Now, this would seem trivial, you know. You know, it, se it seems like the most simple idea. Why are you writing fan fiction? Because I want to. But actually knowing why, the personal motivations you have are really important to help you keep track of your own story as well as to better plan the use and distri distribution of your energy to the project. Writing takes a heck of a lot of time and energy and if you're not motivated, 
you're going to get an incomplete story. And nothing is worse than a perpetually incomplete or canceled story. Hey, I've just finished, I've just taken 10 hours to finish this 100,000 words. Hey, what's this little news update? Sorry, I lost motivation. I'm not finishing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, to my negative to you guys, understand why you guys write. Now, the most common reasons for writing. The first most common reason. <laughs> <laughs> This is a teen-rated panel. Get your minds out of the gutter. All right, the second most is an exercise in world building. I keep on turning these pages too quickly. All right. So many fans desire an opportunity to create their own narratives, but they either they often lack either the confidence or experience to craft their own worlds. Uh, fan fiction will often give writers a chance to stretch those creativity muscles. And Practice with some, you know, with some tried and true, I call it mental exercise equipment. Uh, then there, you know, their alternative history stories, science fiction, and adventure stories are generally of this nature, as they do not necessarily have to be closely tied to the original format of the show. You know, we all have, you know, things we'd like to maybe see a show do that maybe they don't, or you know, we want to see what we could do, but we don't have the confidence to completely create a whole new world, or we're not sure anyone would be interested in it. And that, uh, that brings me to a question I had for us. What do you think the mindset of what they call entry-level creativity, where some people feel that the work is lesser because it's based on a framework that already existed and wasn't necessarily their own? And that, that's a good question. And the thing about that is, is that Everything is an entry level work, really, because everything is a copy of something else when you really get down to it. I mean, there's the idea that there are what? Seven different kinds of stories, and everything else is a remake off of that. And if you get like 36 plots. 36 plots and seven different like narrative styles. So there are millions of stories, and there have been millions of stories, and there will continue to be millions of stories after this. So they're all going to kind of fit into the same general plot, you know. But you know, allow allowing yourself the opportunity to maybe dip your toe into a world, to have something, a template to start off your own world building experiences, is usually a very good opportunity. You know, the third most common reason would be to explain the unexplained. You know. Many intellectual properties will offer aspects of, the, of their world which are vague or left largely unexplored. Unexplained, I guess. Either one. You know, how many, t how many things in My Little Pony do we want explanations for? Thousands. Yeah, all, all of it, yes. And they don't offer any. What happened a thousand years ago? And why is it so gosh darn important? And how much, how much other stuff came back a thousand years? And did anything happen to have happen to occur in the, in between thousand years? Like that's a long time for nothing to happen. Those are the Which makes sense because remember. there's a power vacuum. Like if something major happened, like King Sombra's deposed, everyone else is going to fight over the empire. Yeah, I mean, you would think that you really would. Um, but nope, apparently it was sunshine and rainbows until these six movies showed up out of nowhere. <laughs> honestly, yeah, honestly, then you kind of get into the Batman argument. Did the main six create these villains? <laughs> get a monster uh, in the other one. Uh, one of the uh, episode 100 and and one of the books that, that like follows up on it, uh, Light on Bun Bun and the Nurse from Smile, I think it is. Mm -hmm. It talks about like how there has been this like equestrian CIA or even Stasi, which oh, right. yeah, yeah, which the goal is like keep the civilians in the dark yeah. about, about how terrible oh. their world actually is. Oh, let's see. They, they use yes, 
<laughs> they use memory altering stuff to keep civilians happy and ignorant. Yes. And you know, of course, immediately after that episode came about, there was a whole bunch of Torchwood references and stuff, which I thought was fantastic. But we're gonna, we're actually gonna have to keep the uh, questions and comments to a little bit, at least until the end. Like, I love the comments and questions, but we might have need time at the end, so please leave them for them. But keep them in the back of your mind. All right. So, fan fiction writers who, oh wait, 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 there we go. There we go. Yay. All right, fan fiction writers will use this vagueness as an opportunity to propose their own theories and headcanons. You know, my own my own particular fan fiction. I've been spent. I all started because I wanted to ask, why is Discord called a Draconiquis? Like, if he's the only one of his kind, why does he have a species name? You know, if there was only one human being, we wouldn't call him a human being. We'd call him Steve. Steve. You know, he'd be called Steve by everyone. But no, it's. This is Discord. He's a Draconicus. Well, what's a Draconicus? Discord. Then why did you call him that? But you don't need more than one name, usually. Unless you're specifically implying that that's his species, at which point, or... Wow. And from there, the last three years have been nothing but fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Building up fan fiction. I've had about 13,000 years. Oh, God. Uh, anyway, uh, probably the most com these are probably the most common of all the fan fictions. You know, countless unexplored concepts and phenomena within the mild and funny fan fiction, and these lead to exploratory fix. You know, questions about where does Spike come from? What where happened to Luna? You know, where did King come? King Kong. King Sombra <laughs> come from. Oh, I'm a professional. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, kind of, the comics kind of explain where King Sombra came from. I, I know, and oh, as much as I would cool. love for them to be, yeah. unfortunately, the comics aren't canon. But the Journal of the Two Sisters is, and that does give us a little bit more hints, and I'll talk about that in my mythology of My Little Pony. I'll go into a little bit more detail about that stuff in the mythology of My Little Pony, so be sure to come back here around 2 uh, for that one. Alright, and the fourth, and the fourth and final most common reason, shipping! <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was reason one. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Reason number one is, uh, I can't say, because this is a teen rated panel. Are there children here? Are we all here? I mean, the fan fictions that would make your mother cry. The ones I write. So, at the heart of all literature, it's about the relationship between characters. It's about how characters interact with each other and the world around them. You know, because of the prevalence and importance of this fact, it's only natural for fans of any property to experiment and evolve the relationships that occur within the show, or within the show, within the book series, within any of that. And because of My Little Pony's unique themes and setting, uh, you know, friendship is magic, you know, there's a natural desire to evolve friendship into romance. You know, it, it's, it's, it's almost natural. That's why you can ship anything in this show, because it's all about friendships. It's all about growing the relationships between individuals and characters. Uh, we'll discuss this in further in the segment we're going to have on romance. So, now those are the common good reasons for writing fan fictions. What's a bad reason? I want to be popular. <laughs> While it is entirely possible to gather a large following of fans from writing fan fiction, especially in the Brony fandom, it is actually quite, it's quite, you know, it's quite easy to get, like, to get a good following in the Brony fandom if you market yourself well and if you're devoted to what you're trying to create. Um, but, 
fame is fleeting, and the moment yours wavers and diminishes, you will likely lose all motivation to ever continue writing. If you are writing just to get famous, as soon as you stop being famous, it stops being worth the energy. It's not about being entertained anymore. Yo. Yep, fame should or fame should be a happy bonus you receive from the love of writing. You know, and most importantly, the love of the world you're writing about. You know, because for a lot of you guys, uh, what kind of genres do you guys tend to write about? Uh, any any of you guys, any fan fiction writers, say kind of what your general style is. Action adventure, romance, adventure. adventure, slice of life, slice of life, sci-fi primarily, and some horror here. Generally not with fan fiction, do other stuff. Right. Yeah. Romance. Romance. Woo! Go in the back, in the green. Uh, 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 Zelda. Slice of life. Yes, yeah, slice of life. And you. Alternate history? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, so we've talked about the intention, the reason. Now what about length? Why is length? an important consideration. Actually, it's one of the least of the considerations, but it's still important. And the reason for that is shorter narratives are easier and quicker to finish. They're easier to write and develop than I love writing. Oh my god. You can tell I was working on this for the last like, three weeks. Like, it's, it might be a garbage Professionalism. Oh. Yes! Can you tell I do this for a living? I'm actually a professional critic. Um, uh, Obviously, you need a better, better reader. Yeah, yeah, probably. A better reader. <laughs> I, need, better reader. I need a better reader, but I need a better reader too. Um, better, better. <laughs> but you know, their shorter narratives are easier and quicker to write and develop, but they limit you on your details. Uh, you can't go into a whole lot of side narratives, or you're going to get sidetracked. You're going to bog down the flow and the pacing. However, longer narratives you can get more detail, but they require a lot more energy for both the writer and the reader. How many of you guys have been reading a fan fiction and you see down in the word count, 100,000? <laughs> you see that? Yes. And I'm guessing a lot of you guys' initial reactions are going to be... 2 o'clock in the morning? Who needs sleep? Austria <laughs> 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 yeah. AO series. Oh my god, Austria AO series. 200 <laughs> chapters. Or each Project Horizon. Or, or pro yeah, Project The Chase. 99 uh, worlds. I think it's like 10 stories, each over a million words. Hey, if, if, if you find it of interest, just don't forget to sleep. <laughs> we don't want to be we don't want to be Cartman at the uh, in the World of Warcraft episode. Uh, let's see. So, unless a story can maintain, unless a story can maintain its narrative flow over the entirety of its flow, readers the readers will be burnt out quickly if it's too long. You know, if if, if you drag something out for too long. People will stop being interested in it. It won't be fun anymore. They'll be like, they'll turn, it'll turn into a slog. And this doesn't just happen in fan fiction. It just happens in actual stories. Uh, this might make some people upset to hear they're fans of these two authors. Uh, the Wheel of Time and the Sword of Truth by Robert Jordan and Terry Goodkind. Um, Robert Jordan died, and his books kept getting published. Um, the, the series went on for a really long time. He, he passed away, and they still were publishing his books. Um, and the sort of truth, and the sort of truth, I think, has like what, twenty-seven books in it. And from what I understand, like the first eight are interesting. He drug, he might have dragged it or drug it out a little too long. That no, drawing it out. Was too long. Thank you. I can speak to it. Um, I mean, even some people are saying that about Howard Martin. Mm -hmm. some, even some people are saying about Howard Martin that I mean, he didn't start short either, but now some of his books, there's entire chapters that you could probably remove, and the story would be better with 
Right, and, I'm, and that's always the hardest thing, though, for writers is removing things that you know you like. You, you know, you've been writing this thing for two, like, a year. You've been writing it for a year. You're finally finished, and then you look at it and like, that thing I spent six months on, I don't need it. Yeah. Okay. I, think, I think one of the rules I've heard one from editing is if you, if you just do a rough one straight through, you should probably be able to remove about a third of the words at least. Right. I mean, th there are people, like, particularly with my writing style, people have said that my writing is like being hit in the face with a thesaurus. Um, uh, anyway, we're going to get back. So, what are some good lengths for stories? A good one shot for me is usually between about 3,000 and 8,000 words. Uh, it can be about like 10,000 to 12,000, but larger fix than that should really consider dividing themselves into smaller chapters. You know, some of my favorite one shots are like 10,000 words, but they can keep they can keep that flow. Uh, Multi-chapter stories should be kept like each chapter should be around 3,000 to 5,000 words. Like, you don't want to see a whole bunch of 10,000 word chapters because a lot of readers, a lot of readers will like to intersperse on like, hey, I'm going to read one chapter tonight, then I'm going to read another one tomorrow. But if they see 20,000 word chapter, well, that's tomorrow. And then tomorrow becomes two weeks from now. And then, hey, was I reading that? Uh, let me take that off the watch later. I can't find any of my other stuff. So, you know, keeping yourself, dividing up your chapters actually helps a long way in getting your readers to keep reading. It, help, it helps you to maintain retention. But, uh, do not compromise your story's narrative flow or dramatic tension in order to maintain that 3,000 to 5,000 rule. If you're going to cut off your story at a bad point, if you split it up into 5,000 words, like you have a 10,000 story uh, story, and you want to split it up into 5,000 words each. And it's going to like completely ruin your narrative structure and flow. Don't do it. Keep the 10,000 words. It, it's perfectly fine. Or even better, maybe split it up into 7,000 words and put that 3,000 as like an epilogue or something. Figure some other way around it is you have to maintain your narrative flow because length is also about helping to structure how your readers will be delivered that message. Now, the one that's going to take the most amount of time, and d just remember, questions and comments will be at the end because I know some of you guys are chomping at the bit for questions, comments, and tell me how I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, so, next will be genre. What tropes and cliches define and limit your story. You know, understanding what your, the genres that your story falls into is critical to avoiding and using the various tropes and pitfalls that particular genres tend to uh, tend to possess. And while no particular genre is really easy, there's no such thing as easy writing. There really isn't. Uh, some genres do lend themselves to fan fiction easier than others. You know. We'll be able to discuss uh, genres one at a time, roughly. I actually kind of split them up into like two groups or maybe even three if they all kind of fit within the same style of genre. Uh, and we'll be able to give some good and bad examples of each. Now, the first one's going to be Slife of Lice and Adventure. These two genres are perhaps the most difficult to distinguish from each other, and yet, they're the easiest to adapt to My Little Pony fan fiction due to the, how the show is structured. You know, generally the differences between Slice of Life and Adventure Stories stems from how they approach the structure of the overall narrative arc. Uh, you know, and what do I mean by that? Basically the narrative arc is how the story is presented to you. It's the rising action, the climax, and the epilogue. Now, in Slice of Life, the narrative arc encompasses numerous episodes and multiple closed sub-narratives. So it would be Pinkie Pie goes to the dentist, adventure, and at the conclusion of dentist, you 
get a, we get a, the conclusion. Now we might have some things that go like that might be the first of many different stories that occur in a slice of life, like a day in the life of Pinkie Pie. You have she goes to the dentist. You know she works at the bakery. You know, and each one of those would have their own rising and uh, rising and falling arcs. You know, and they would all kind of lead into each other. But throughout, you might see things that lead over into larger narratives. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm kind of a bit off. Uh, so you know, slice of life generalized on simple day to day. Uh, routines and events, with the potential for an occasional mini adventures. You know, My Little Pony is a slice of life, but every so often they'll go to the Crystal Empire and throw a party. Uh, great, great advantage for an epic story, and they throw a party. <laughs> Sauron's in the distance. Throw a nice shit. Uh, <laughs> and stairs. And stairs. Honestly, I have my own theories about how we could make a true the Crystal Empire significantly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, shining armor being turned into a thrall of Sauron when he gets the crystals in his head. Oh, oh very nice. Yeah, because, you know, you would have had... Sombra needed orcs. He needed some ever-looming muscular threat that could have, you know, been his muscle in the city while he's just being off being terrifying in the distance. Like Sauron, that's what he's supposed to be. I'll get into that in the mythology of my life. All right. Now, to compare, adventures, they're much more, uh, the narrative arc is much more, wait, what? I think I got that. Oh, yeah, thank you, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, th this is what I meant. In adventure, the narrative arcs are more concise. They often lack huge sub-narratives. And what I mean by that is side adventures that all play, like, that are like playing in an ordinary time, repetitive sub-adventures. Usually with an adventure story, we're off to go there. And that is the entire uh, point. The entire narrative flows with the expectation that at the end, or at least at the end of the trilogy, or however it works, going to reach there, wherever there is. And that's what, and that's kind of what defines an adventure from a, from a slice of life. And a good example of the way to think about this is Game of Thrones versus Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is an adventure story. It's all about getting the ring to Mordor. Nothing else, like there are some side quests maybe, but nothing ever takes away from the overall point of the narrative getting the ring to Mordor. That is the end-all, be-all. If you compare that to Game of Thrones, where there is no direction, it is about the day-to-day -day and death lives of the people of Westeros from the perspective of these rich nobles. Nothing else, like, there's, there are maybe adventuring points where they go off and they do a great quest, but for the, by and large, it's mostly dealing with legislation, their day-to-day -day schemings, you know, what they do in a day. It's more slice of life oriented. But that doesn't mean it doesn't still have some adventure or fantasy elements. It just, it's, it states how the narrative is presented. You know, slice of life tends to be comprised of lot, much larger main casts, from which as many sub-narratives can be derived, and is far more focused upon the personal and past relationships between all the characters. Slice of Life tend to be much more character-focused than adventure stories. Now, that's not a given, but it, it does tend to sometimes be the case. You know, it's much more, you know, again, looking at Game of Thrones, it's much more about how Ned Stark is, real, like, how he knows Robert Baratheon, how and how they relate to Joffrey and Tommen and Marcella and all that. Those relationships are at the key, or at the, at the cornerstone of, you know, at the cornerstone of a slice of life adventure. They can span years and even lifetimes. You know, there are quite a few, like, 
bio slice of life, where you start off with a character being born and you see a fan fiction all the way up until their character dies, like from their birth to their death. And that's actually rather interesting. Now, some good examples would include the life of a non-Brony series by a Brony writer. So that's the uh, T.D. Harrison Powell stories. I don't know if any of you guys might be familiar with them. As well as University Days by Don Fay. That's a very good example. Okay? It, it, does tend, it does have a little bit more of a concise character group, but it still does maintain a lot of the slice of life elements. Just with a much more, it still has a concise narrative, but it's much more about the little episodic points of their adventures that are all building up on the romance. And, you know, to contrast, adventure is comprised of much smaller main casts to ensure a greater focus on the growth of, you know, of the, those characters and to keep the narrative centralized. The Fellowship of the Ring, there are nine members. Eight. Seven. Eight again. Uh, <laughs> But it, it all tends to focus much more on the world itself and the character's relationship with that world. King Aragorn is only really acknowledgeable in his characteristics in how he relates to the kingdom of Gondor. You know, why is Frodo doing what he's doing? Because of the Shire. Or why is the ring important? Because it allows them to control the minds, it allows them to control the minds of everyone who wields the ring. It's, absolute power to eventually hold dominion over the world. The world is more at what's stake rather than the relationships between the characters. And MLP stories can have a great deal more freedom than, you know, maybe slice of life stories because they don't have to stick to the fundamentals of the original narrative. Adventure stories in My Little Pony can go into a whole lot of different areas because, again, the show is primarily slice of life. Adventure stories can be a bit more risky, a bit more high stakes, and usually a little bit more, a little darker. They also tend to involve much smaller time scales, uh, though this is not a given. Lord of the Rings takes place over like three years. I know the, the movies don't sell that, but the books. Bilbo is declared dead. Mm -hmm. In the original The Hobbit, the end, there's a subplot at the very end where Bilbo is declared deeply dead. Right. He's been gone for so long, he was declared dead. All right. Now, some good examples of that would be Chaotic Neutral by Seapop, uh, which is a Discord fic, as well as Of Age, which is by Paleo Rider. It's a uh, Sparity fic. <laughs> OTP. Uh, <laughs> Some good tips for writing slice of life and adventures. Uh, nearly any story you're going to write or could write could be qualified or quantified as a slice of life or adventure. As such, any advice you could really give for a slice of life could honestly just go, like could honestly just go towards improving any kind of genre or any genre, and also that kind of works vice versa. Any advice I give you to improve on the other genres will go a long way towards helping your slice of life and adventure story. But also, analyze the TV shows, movies, and other stories that organize their narratives in the, in the way you're wanting to write, and learn from those. If you want to write a slice of life, see how Game of Thrones does it. You want to see, you want to know how to write a good adventure, do what every other fantasy and science fiction writer in the history of since 1955 has done, and copy The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless of whatever your choice, you must, must follow the three-act structure. It exists for a purpose, and it, that purpose is to maintain the interests of your readers. It is the easiest to follow, and you want to be experimental? Great. Don't expect a lot of readers with, fun, with experimental. And that, and while you do enjoy, you should enjoy writing for its writing's sake. It is always wonderful when you can get people to write or to read, sorry, to read your stories. Now. 
the next genre. Oh. Romance! The goal of romance fiction is to provide the reader with a natural and believably evolving relationship between two or more likable characters. This is actually my personal favorite of the genres. Romance rarely ever appears as a pure genre. It generally plays second banana to other genres, like adventure stories, in order to justify the situations we can foster those romantic interactions. You know, again, as I was stating earlier, romance is a very common subgenre of MLP fiction due to the focus on friendship lending itself well to a relationship focus in romance. You know, the relationship can, or, really, or, sorry, relationships can end in relationships or not. Relationships small. Are relationships anyone else before presenting this? What? He shows that anyone else before presenting. I finished this two night days ago. Is that a no then? That would be a no. Yes. Also, I like all of this is getting recorded. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the editing is for. Yep, it's all getting recorded. This is all for posterity. <laughs> I'm a professional. What would be a recommendation of don't show people your on your, your, your first draft? We're here for you. We still love you. What? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this is a <laughs> Now, where were they? I lost. Uh, uh, right, okay. So, stories can end in a relationship or not, as long as it is satisfying and fair to the characters and reader. You know, there are actually quite a few uh, romance fics where the, where the couple that start off don't end up together. And that's okay. As long as you make it believable and you make it respectful to everyone involved. And that includes the characters. Because for almost any story you're going to write, you're going to fall in love with these characters. You're going to want to see good things happen to them. And unfortunately, for the sake of drama, you often have to make bad things happen to them. You know? Ever want to understand, you know, maybe the argument for why God allows bad things to happen? <laughs> Write a story. You'll suddenly feel exactly the kind of stress that you have to create for good drama and character growth. Uh, let's see. Anyway, the conflict has to be born within the reader. Like, the romance, the, the development of the romance is not in and of, in and of itself conflict. It's the issues that getting into that relationship, the will they, won't they, and the love triangle, although the love triangle can be done really poorly, because you, because you, in a good love triangle, you should empathize with all parties. You should be able to understand and relate to all three parties, and honestly, feel comfortable with whichever option gets taken. There's a really good Spike uh, fan fiction. I'm trying to remember for the life of me what it's called, but it's basically where he is starts off in a relationship with Rarity that ends, and then he gets into a relationship with Princess Luna. And throughout the story, there's a whole plot triangle. And at the end, the reader gets to decide on two endings whether which one he get which one he ends up with. And both work because of how the, the author delivers Rarity and Princess Luna's relationship to Spike. It feels respectful. Now, the tips for good romance. Make it natural. Romance relies on your reader maintaining their investment in the character. Unlikable or chemistry is key. You know, unlikable and unrealistic relationships will not satisfy the reader. And that's not to say that crack ship, crack, you know, crack ship fix can't work. They actually can, really, really well. Uh, you know, some good examples. 
The work of King of Beggars. Have any of you guys read the stuff from King of Beggars? No one? Sounds familiar, but I haven't read it. Yeah, he did, he did a story called... That, that pops up on my computer like every 30 minutes. Uh, anyway. It's not Windows 10. <laughs> Is he the one who did Rainbow Dash and Kitchen Sink? I don't think so, but you know what he did do? Spike and Octavia. In a, in a, he, he, no, he did a Spike and Octavia fan fiction called Playing the Scales. Yeah. Yes. He also did a Spike and Lyra story that he made a sequel to with Rarity and Derpy. <laughs> and they are all three fantastic stories. Oh, he also did a Big Mac Berry Punch, and it sounds as fantastic as it is as fantastic as it sounds. I swear I'm more articulate than this. <laughs> I swear I am. Of course, digging pellets in the morning. Anyway, so we, let's see, what, all right, okay. So we need to develop the backstories of your characters and give them a life in conversations outside of the narrative-driven romance plot. Senpai, notice me. What? Senpai, notice me. Yeah, please don't do just senpai, notice me. That is really cheap, like, the, those are the, uh, Oh, what's your name? The Meg, the Meg Ryan romance stories. You know, it's the, oh, she's a strong, independent woman. And the only thing wrong is she doesn't have a guy. That is so boring. Don't do that. Make them interesting. Make them flawed. Give them music. If you're going to do that, make it beyond bearing. Yeah, if you're going to do it, per, make, make it specifically... But make it more comedic in that way. You're like make make it so you're completely aware of the fact that this is ridiculous. This is silly. This is we know exactly what's going on here. Winking to the audience because audiences will actually appreciate that quite a bit. Now, oh uh, yeah, and of course because of that, that's the reason why it's much better to pair this off with other genres. You know, a mystery genre with romance subplots, an adventure story with romance subplots, a slice of life where over time the relationship is developing more and more and more. Because it allows you an opportunity to, to kind of push your characters into situations that not just get them. Just spit into the mic. Uh, Alright. Anyway, the uh, tips for good romance. One more is slow and steady win the race. You will, you will actually rarely find a good one-shot romance. Like you'll find some really passable, like plot fix for certain. Those exist everywhere, and you that some of them are actually quite passable as narratives in and of themselves. But again, you know. <laughs> Because of the nature of the relationship, yes? I just want to make sure, when you're saying you can't, you can't do, it's hard to do one shot for romance. You're saying a romance arc instead of like yeah. an event in an ongoing romance. Right, so yeah. Know, that, I that, feel there's a lot of things where it, like, the first paragraph establishes that X romance is already in yes, place. Yes, that, 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 and then that's the <coughs> actually actually. Thank you for helping me clarify on that one. I'm not meaning that in and of itself you can't have an established relationship before, like in a single story, but that if you're wanting to develop a relationship over the course of your story, you cannot do it in one shot. Now, there are some exceptions, and you know, obviously the biggest exception for me would be King of Beggars. Every single one of those stories I mentioned one shot. 
They're all about like 10,000, 12,000, I think maybe even 20,000 words. But they're good. They're very high quality. You see this natural relationship progress. But they're also coupled with, I think, like slide. No, they're actually coupled with comedies. Alright. And the reason for this, you know, you need slow and steady, you need time, is because successful romance demands unromantic tension. You know, show your characters growing into each other, watch them change each other, and allow the readers to suffer alongside them. The slower the narrative, the greater the tension. But don't go so long that it is no longer natural, as tension can snap and turn off readers. You know, how often, like, KP, she's a, like, she's a huge fan of Kim Possible. In the Kim Possible series, how many people watched that? Out of curiosity. Alright, so any of you guys who watched it really bit, like I watched all the episodes when I could. How many people were waiting for Kim Possible and Ron Stop to get together? Honestly. How long were they waiting for that one? Forever. Forever, yes. But it did a really good job and it delivered at exactly the right moment. It is delivered at exactly the right time. And so the tension was preserved. But tension can go for too long to the point of which, just, just kiss already! <laughs> that totally happens a lot more than you would think. Maybe become sweetie though. Yeah. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> and you know, as I was saying, even crack ships can make for great fan fiction. And because what show implied relationships are fantastic, and they give a great deal of leeway for writers to use evidence to support such a ship, don't ever hesitate to pair characters with contradictory personalities or those who never share screen time. Readers like to be thrilled and shocked, and a good crack ship can do this. You know, I'm a huge Sparity fan. I'm actually the number one Sparity fan, and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, Playing with Scales is one of my favorite fan fictions. And it is a Spike Octavia story where Spike was per previously in a relationship with Rarity. I should hate that. I don't. Yep. Because, again, the key to any romance is chemistry. As long as you can create that in your story, the relationship can work, no matter how ridiculous it might sound. Then, of course, we're getting into some of the newer genre tabs. Mystery. This never used to be a tab on fan fiction. Now it is. And it's much better for it. And actually, I'm going to compare mystery fix to how we would approach romance fix, because there's actually quite a few similarities. You know, well, the conflict of romance stems from the events which result in the evolution of a relationship between characters. Mysteries stem from the central events acting as a motivation to uncover the relationships already present between the characters in connection with those events. You know, in a romance, we go, we watch the adventures that show these characters getting together. In a mystery, we're given an event that tells us, that forces us to figure out how all these characters are connected to each other. So it's basically, it's, a con it's the differences between future relationships, romance, and past relationships, mysteries. Some good examples would be uh, All the Mortal Remains by Colin Gardet. I think that it's by, by Colin Gardens. Uh, Heirlooms by Rocinante. It's not labeled as a mystery, but it does maintain many of the qualities therein. Uh, any of you guys heard of Heirlooms? Alright, so another may have seen that one, I don't know that good. Right. Several years ago, right? Uh, uh, maybe about a year ago. You know, it, it's another good one. It, it's basically, uh, Rainbow is looking at her family tree and asks Twilight for help. It's a nice big twist at the end. If you have any knowledge of aviation history. <laughs> Alright, and another one would be the Adamant Triskelion. Triskelion series by Ponydora Prancy Pants. 
Uh, it has elements of mystery woven throughout. And as soon as it finishes the second story, it's coming. I hope it's coming. The first one was so good. <laughs> I give it up.